makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Dramatic reversal. Sam Altman will return as OpenAI's chief executive officer, along with a board overhaul. Meanwhile, NVIDIA's results receive a cool response, sending the shares lower. Israel and Hamas agree on a plan to free dozens of hostages from Gaza in return for a four-day pause in fighting and the release of some Palestinian prisoners. Plus, boosting business, the UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt is set to announce permanent tax relief on investment spending in his autumn statement. We're live at Westminster. Now, to take a look at the European market map now, the focus is firmly on a lot of the stocks relating to AI. Stocks are a little bit mixed, I guess. A lot of the dollar, or the dollar, is gaining before some of the U.S. economic data. Uh, there's a lot that traders will want to weigh in for. Now, actually, in the last couple of minutes, we're seeing a bit of a reversal. Uh, some of these stocks were mixed, and now they're slightly edging higher. Now, data on U.S. jobless claims, durable and capital goods orders, also consumer sentiment uh, later today may provide clues on the direction of monetary policy after minutes from the Fed's rate meeting revealed that officials remain in a cautious mode. We're also getting the ECB warning on the weak economy, and that's heightening stability risks from some of the hikes. Does that mean that they're done uh, hiking? Does it mean that they're just looking at some protection in certain sectors that could be vulnerable? Certainly that's the latest from the EU Financial Stability Report, and we'll get you more on that when we get it. Now, OpenAI says it's reached an agreement in principle for Sam Altman to return as chief executive. The move marks a stunning U-turn from the company after it shocked investors by firing the co-founder Altman just last Friday. Now, let's get more with Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg intelligence. Matt, I have to say, everything is coming. My head is spinning. I mean, this is probably one of the most extraordinary stories uh, that we've seen for a while in, in the tech space. So what do these changes in terms of governments mean for open AI and, and the model going forward? Yeah, I think we're still waiting to hear the answers to those questions. I think, you know, this is only really a, fir a first step. So the old board's out. There's a completely new board. Sam Altman's back as CEO, but won't be a board member, at least, at least for now. I think the, a lot of the press outlets are suggesting that this three-person board will basically now look to vet candidates to expand it maybe up to nine. So there's a question mark there about whether Microsoft will get a board seat, which obviously they've been lacking before. Um, so I think that there's big governance changes um, in play. I think, you know, obviously, historically, the governance has really protected the kind of AI safety and security aspects of being a responsible developer of this technology. I think there are some safeguards there to protect that going forward, but maybe there'll be um, a more integrated balance between the commercial interests and the kind of more uh, kind of uh, societal um, interests they have at heart. So, Matt, I guess the question is, are there going to be warring factions inside? So is it going to need and take some time for things to stabilize? And how significant is this move from Microsoft and its AI strategy? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the composition of the board and what's gone on in the last few days suggests that actually um, that the kind of direction of travel is now much more aligned. I think this is a board that's supportive of Sam Altman. Microsoft's clearly supportive of him too. So I think there's kind of um, less concern there. I think for, for Microsoft, this is, this is a good outcome. I mean, I think they've positioned themselves incredibly well and done a great job uh, of being very pragmatic about what's going on. So I think, you know, they've got a huge investment in, in uh, the, this business and it's uh, kind of integral to all of their AI products they're rolling out. So I think the fact that they've got Sam Altman back in place is clearly a very strong relationship between Microsoft and Sam Altman. If they get a board seat as well, then I think they'll have kind of really locked down uh, their control and influence over this important company. Interesting. Matt, thank you so much for all of your insight. Matt has stopped, well, has stopped sleeping basically for the last five days because mm -hmm. he's been reporting on the story so closely. Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, let's stay in the tech space. And NVIDIA investors gave a cool reaction to its latest quarterly report, which blew past estimates, uh, failed to satisfy the massive expectations of shareholders who have bet heavily on the AI boom. You can see NVIDIA down 1% pre-market. So let's also switch gear and talk about the economy. The German government is dealing with a 
fallout from a shock budget ruling. Now, the country's top court ruled it unlawful to reallocate 60 billion euros of COVID-19 funds. So with me now, Catherine Nice, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income. Catherine, as always, great to have you on the program. I have a million questions on actually some of the fiscal space, some of the things that we're seeing in the stability report. But what's going on with Germany? Are you, are you worried that actually the snowballs into significantly weakening the government and, and what they can spend? Well, it's a fluid situation, and I think the bottom line is we don't yet know what the impact is going to be. But my gut reaction to this is that, at least from an immediate kind of macro perspective, that this is 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 not really going to shift the dial. And for a couple of reasons. Firstly, often when Germany says it's going to spend a certain amount of money, it doesn't often spend all of that. Fair. And so, if you take it away, it's it's you know we're not taking away the full 60. We have to remember that this 60 billion in any any case was being spread over three years so really we're talking about 20 billion I think there are some things that they can do at the margin in terms of cutting expenditure raising revenues that could help kind of make the sums add up um, you know so I think it won't be very impactful and in any case our euro area expectations for next year I don't think we ever really expected Germany to be the engine of growth so this isn't really changing my view on the macro outcome but you know that that could change as this develops. Um, Catherine at the same time so we had this financial stability report it does seem that the overall backdrop ha has improved what do you worry about the most though for, for the European economy. So I haven't seen the report. I'm not okay. surprised that they're saying that the risks have receded. You have to remember the last time they wrote this was on the back of the SVB fallout. Mm -hmm. uh, interest rates were rising rapidly. Central banks were doing QT. So it really felt like there were you know, risks on multiple fronts. So I think it's good that it's receding. Um, I would say the biggest risk, and from your headline, I think this is uh, what the FSR is saying, is, is really a very rapid deterioration in the euro area economy. It's not yeah. what we're expecting but that would create financial stability risks and I don't think that we can take external shocks off the table a negative supply shock we've got these geopolitical risks or potentially maybe Japan monetary policy normalization so those are the kind of external shocks no. but I think at home in Europe the big worry will be is this economy really going to start to deteriorate rapidly yeah and I and this is you know partly also because of hikes we're also looking at quite a lot of data coming from the US what does it mean for your fixed income space like what do you want to buy into now. So it looks to me a little bit like the market's gotten ahead of itself in terms of pricing in these cuts, uh, particularly in the euro area. We can't forget the ECB has a very narrow mandate. They're very focused on price stability. And because of these external shocks, I think that's asymmetric for inflation. So I'm not expecting cuts to come from the ECB until well into 2024. So I think the market's probably a bit too excited there. Um, for the UK, I think that's a tougher call. And in the US, we are expecting some moderation and there I think the cuts to interest rates are more about adjusting peak rate yeah. rather than embarking on some sort of aggressive easing cycle because uh, the Fed is worried that the US economy is 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 rapidly deteriorating so so that's my expectation in kind of fixed income space okay Catherine you hold that thought because we'll come back to you and we'll talk a lot about the autumn statement Catherine nice there from PGM coming up we're live in Westminster ahead of the UK autumn statement a little bit later we'll also hear from the shadow chief secretary to the treasury right after the break. This is Bloomberg. In a few hours, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, will deliver his autumn statement. Now, personal tax cuts could be on the way, as well as a plan to boost business investments by £20 billion. Let's go to Lizzie Burden, who's at Westminster now, with a guest. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, Francine. Yeah, I'm joined by Darren Jones, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, in a very noisy, busy Westminster this morning. We've got some music, so maybe we can speak in rhythm. Darren, I just want to talk to you about the Stonehaven poll published by Bloomberg this morning that shows that the Tory path to denying you a majority is actually tighter than previously thought. Is Labour concerned by that? 
Look, we're very confident going into the next election because the Labour Party has changed under Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves. We think our offer is the right offer for the country. And of course, the Conservatives are going to fight to hang on uh, at the next election. But the autumn statement will show today that after 13 years of economic failure, their plan has failed. It's time for a change in this country. And we obviously think that needs to be a Labour government at the next election. Is it responsible to cut taxes now? If they're affordable and fully costed, we agree in the Labour Party that taxes on working people need to come down because on average families are paying £4,000 a year more in tax. And people will be saying, never have I paid so much tax, but what am I getting for all of that money when our public services are on their knees and the economy is heading in the wrong direction? So as long as the maths add up, uh, we support the uh, announced cut on national insurance today. But how would you balance tax cuts with public spending? Because philosophically, you're more towards the public spending end of the spectrum, aren't you? Well, we support public services. We created most of them uh, in the Labour Party and our history and government in this country. And people rely on a health service that works at schools that educate our children properly, proper policing on our streets. But we can only pay for good public services if our economy is on the right track. So the, the projections on economic growth are really important. Under the Conservatives, according to the Bank of England, that's 0% of economic growth. We have a very comprehensive plan for growing the economy so that we can pay for our public services more effectively over time. Well, are you therefore concerned that the fiscal headroom you may inherit from the Conservatives if you become a government is going to make it impossible to enact your plans? Well, the Tories, you know, over 13 years have been increasingly economically incompetent. Uh, and we've got to the point where in March last year, the fiscal headroom was about £6 billion. Pounds. You would normally expect 20 to 30 billion quid down the back of the sofa just in case. So they've been running it very, very close already. And that's why today it's going to be really important that we look at how all of their announcements add up and how they're paying for it at a time when we need to see debt uh, reducing as a percentage of the size of the economy, not going up. But of course, we have been through a pandemic and a cost of living crisis. If you got in, would you have to delay the £28 billion of investment even further? So we said we're going to ramp up to, to that by the end of the Parliament, so over four or five years. Uh, but all of our policies, whether the Green Prosperity Plan or others, are subject to our fiscal rules. Uh, so we have to get debt falling as a percentage of the size of our economy over the course of the next Parliament, and that's what we will do. Are you being honest, though, about how quickly you could move? Well, government's actually not very good at spending capital as it is. On average, one pound in every six goes unspent. And actually, most of our focus is how we unlock uh, lots of available private capital uh, into the projects this country needs. So, so we think that where we invest a pound of public money in the sectors or technologies where we have to de-risk them because they're not yet fully commercially viable, we can crowd in at least three pounds of private sector finance. And your party's made big efforts to get buy-in from business. You said that you would make full expensing permanent. Can you afford that alongside your green commitments? Well, it looks like the Conservatives are going to announce that today, which we welcome. We've been calling for that for some time. In fact, the Conservatives were attacking the Labour Party not very long ago for calling for this, even though we've been hearing from business this is a great way to unlock investment in our economy. So if it's announced today, it will have to be fully costed. And again, we'll check the maths. But if it's fully costed, then we will carry that through into government if we win the next election. In terms of the approach to welfare, do you agree that you do need to use a carrot and a stick to get people back to work. The Shadow Chancellor herself says that there are some people who play the system. So we've long said that the work capability assessments need to be reviewed and reformed. We approved that at what was called our National Policy Forum not very long ago in partnership with the trade unions. Of course, there have to be rules around welfare payments and we want people to be in work. We are the Labour Party. We're the party of good work. Um, but it's important that the system helps people to get back into work. And it's no coincidence that there are two 2.6 million people out of work and over 7 million people waiting in the NHS backlog. So that's the carrot, but what would be your stick? Well, the conditions that are in place for welfare payments are pretty well established. And if people who are capable of working are choosing not to work, there are already sanctions in place. But it's important that job centres and other parts of the welfare system support people to get back into work as opposed to just uh, punishing them with a sanction at the end if they've not had that support to get back to work. But we do think the backlog buster policy that we've announced to get people seen more quickly in the National Health Service, especially for things like musculoskeletal pain and mental ill health, will unlock a lot of available labour in the market for people to get back to work. All right, Darren Jones, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, thank you for joining me. Francine, we'll get that autumn statement at 12.30 in the House of Commons after Prime Minister's questions.
Yeah, thank you so much, Lizzie. And we'll have a full show, of course, to go with the autumn statement to, to understand where that leaves the UK in terms of fiscal space, where that leaves the UK in terms of the economy. Lizzie Bird in there with Darren Jones. Now, let's go back to Catherine Nice, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income. Catherine, first of all, thank you for, for sticking around. It, it's clear that, I guess, the UK has a little bit more fiscal room, but still, I guess, not as much as most uh, G7 countries that we're looking at. So what kind of autumn statement are you expecting from the Chancellor? Um, I, th I think big picture is that we're not expecting anything to be macroeconomically meaningful to be announced um, at this statement, that really they will save the big bazooka for spring um, for two reasons. One is it will maybe give them a bit more confidence that some of the good news that we've had on revenues is actually, um, you know, not just a, a kind of a one-off, that, that, that it's a bit more sustainable. And secondly, I mean, I'm not a political strategist, but that you know it could be more helpful to make these announcements in the spring near to the time of the election so I think and then the final reason is you know we've got a bit of a bad memory perhaps from this time last year when we had a similar sort of announcements so I would have expected that the key focus will be to kind of hit on some key messages maybe a little bit around tax cuts because of this good news a big focus on supply side get the economy to grow but crucially that all of this stuff has been added up and been vetted by the OBR, so it's costed, and no big surprises. I would have thought that that's what they're aiming for. Catherine, I mean, overall, if you're an investor, what, and uh, Rishi Sunak is also doing this Global Investment Summit on, on Monday with many people from, you know, Wall Street, the heavyweights are coming over, but what's the, the kind of investment opportunity in the UK? Things look cheap, but there are elections, you don't know who's in power, and there's been flip-flopping on certain policies. Yeah, so I would say that there's two things. I mean, one of the big measures that um, we're expecting today is this uh, expensing of capital allowances um, to be taken, uh, extended beyond its, its end date. And I think this is potentially really important for the UK because the UK really does look like an outlier and not in a good way when it comes to investment compared to G7 economies. We are the lowest at 19% of GDP. Italy, US, are higher at 20, 21 percent. Japan and France are way higher at 25 percent. You know, 1 percent, 5 percent of GDP in these countries, these are big numbers. So it is notable that the UK is lower. We have seen that this super deduction um, looks like it is having a boost on investment in the UK. We saw big growth in the first quarter of this year. So I think that is potentially creating, you know, a, a more friendly investment environment for the UK. But if we look at what businesses are telling us, um, the Bank of England looks at a decision maker panel survey, for example, businesses do cite uncertainty. You know, it's alongside the tax, uh, you know, incentives. I think a business environment that is certain where you, you have have a degree of confidence of what the world is going to look yeah. like in the future is important too. So I think governments can do a lot to sort of create that degree of certainty for investment. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. Catherine Nicer, European, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income. Now coming up, Israel approves a deal that will see Gaza hostages released in exchange for pause in fighting. A closer look at the agreement is coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. U.S. President Joe Biden has welcomed an Israeli deal with Hamas that will free about 50 hostages from the Gaza Strip. Now, the agreement, which was mediated by Qatar, includes a four-day pause in fighting and the release of some Palestinian prisoners. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg Opinion's Mark Champion, who's been following this very closely. So, Mark, what is the deal and what does it mean for the war? Yes, so essentially there'll be uh, four days of no fighting. Uh, the uh, uh, Hamas will have to hand over 50 uh, women and children from among the 240 or so hostages that it took on October the 7th. Uh, the Israelis in return will release about 150 women and children from the prisoners they hold in jails. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, there are various other details such as that uh, Hundreds of trucks of aid, including fuel, would be brought in uh, to help with civilians. Um, and also that there will be no overflights in the south, uh, limited uh, at times of no overflights in the north, uh, which will kind of limit um, uh, surveillance and so on. So what it really uh, it, you know, means is it, it, 
President Netanyahu, I mean, sorry, sorry Prime Minister Netanyahu has made it very clear uh, that this is not the end of the war. Uh, the Qataris who mediated the deal said they hope that it can lead to a permanent ceasefire. Uh, the Israelis have said no, uh, the war will restart. It is possible that it can get extended uh, by uh, a, a daily uh, with if Hamas releases 10 hostages uh, each day. Um, it sounds like a sort of re truly inhumane calculus, and it is. Uh, it, this militarily, the hostages are extremely important, primarily because uh, the, the worst of the fighting that the Israelis will have to do is underground in Hamas's tunnels. That's where the hostages are. Um, and the more hostages that you can get out of those tunnels, uh, the, the more uh, freedom uh, the Israeli uh, defense forces will have uh, to use means other than just going into tunnels where their normal equipment, like you know, night vision, communications, and so on, just doesn't work, uh, and they're at a disadvantage. Uh, normally, what you'd, they would want to do is flood the tunnels, for example, but they just can't do that so long as the hostages are there. So that's the really brutal calculus. Hamas won't want to give up so many hostages that uh, the tunnels can just be flooded, uh, and the Israelis will want to get as many out as they possibly can. Mark, thank you for the update. Uh, Bloomberg Opinion's Mark Champion, of course, we'll have plenty more on this throughout the day. Also coming up, will OPEC Plus extend oil production cuts or <clears throat> will they deepen them? Well, we look ahead to this week's key meeting with Endurant Capital Management's Pierre Endurant. He's next, and this is Bloomberg. Dramatic reversal. Sam Altman will return as OpenAI's chief executive along with a board overhaul. Meanwhile, NVIDIA's results receive a cool response, sending the shares a little bit lower. Israel and Hamas agree on a plan to free dozens of hostages from Gaza in return for a four-day pause in fighting and the release of some Palestinian prisoners. Plus, boosting business while the UK Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, is expected or is set to announce permanent tax relief on investment spending in his autumn statement a little bit later. We also have a full dedicated show to the autumn statement. But good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So let's focus on oil and oil prices have steadied ahead of an OPEC plus meeting over the weekend. Now the group will decide on continuing cuts to output on signs of another stockpile buildup in the U.S. Now let's find out more on all of this from the founder of Endurant Capital Management, Pierre Endurant, who joins us now. Pierre, thank you, first of all, for joining us. I mean, OPEC plus is always rather exciting because they've surprised, you know, in the past, but actually if you look at the price of oil, they've always been right. What are you expecting them to do this time around? So it's a bit tricky. So I think the Saudis would want to see higher prices. Um, but when you look at you know, current OPEC production or OPEC plus production or exports um, over the last month or two, they've been the same as the average of the last year. So despite all the announcements of cuts, uh, OPEC plus as a group has not cut much production at all since last year. Saudis cut, but against that, we, and, and Russia margi did like marginal cuts, mm -hmm. but against that, we had a lot more oil from Iran and more oil from, um, from Iraq and from West Africa. So overall, you know, like we, we haven't had like much uh, OPEC plus cuts. So I think the Saudis will probably want the other countries to cut as well. Um, so I think it's going to be a negotiation where they, they, the Saudis will probably use that lollipop cut as a, as a potential stick if the other countries don't cut more. And why I think we need a cut is actually we had much larger U.S. supply growth than expected this year. So we had you know, 1.5 million barrels a day total liquid growth relative to last year, which is one of like the, in the top three supply growth uh, in history in the U.S. So the, uh, like we were expecting much lower, uh, much lower supply growth. Mm -hmm. Um, and also a lot of Iranian oil came back and we didn't lose um, Rus any Russian oil pretty much. And we had more oil from Iraq and, um, and West but, Africa. Yeah, so, so what does a meaningful cut actually look like that you think will be achieved? I mean, there's so much geopolitical uh, uncertainty as well. I wonder whether everyone's a little bit in, in a wait and see situation. Yeah, I think in terms of geopolitical risk, people, you know, uh, wait for something to happen before positioning for it because yeah. I think so much money has been lost positioning for that and then nothing happened. So look, you know, last year, mm -hmm. Russia invade, you know, invaded Ukraine and, you know, we didn't lose any oil mm -hmm. uh, and we got some SPR release. So, so actually it was a bearish event for the oil market. Um, since 2005, 
you know, people have been you know, um, positioning for a war with Iran and losing money because it never happened. Um, so I think um, the market generally tends to discount potential geopolitical risk, wait for the supply disruptions to happen, and then the price moves. Uh, so I don't think it's over, I and mean, potentially we could have disruptions, but mm -hmm. they have not happened yet. Um, so I think we have to go back to fundamentals, looking yeah. at supply growth versus demand growth. Demand growth is very strong, so despite yeah. all the fears of um, a really weak macroeconomic outlook, demand growth this year is estimated to be around 2.3 million barrels a day, mm -hmm. which is twice the average, uh, an, an average demand growth. Mm -hmm. uh, so demand growth is not the issue, uh, and we still have some recovery to uh, happen post-COVID, because some countries have not fully re reopened, mainly in Asia. Yeah. So, so I think there's still a bit more demand growth to come. But the supply has been the issue, a lot more supply than expected. But so, so you, were, you actually started the year by calling, I think, oil to be at around yeah. $140 yeah. a barrel. Yeah. Are you sticking to that? Or are you no, not to really, bring because um, bring it down because we had a lot more supply from Iran. I didn't expect you know, the U.S. administration to close their eyes on uh, and to stop enforcing Iranian sanctions. So Iran exports pretty much as much as before the sanctions. Um, and U.S. supply growth is probably 800, 700 to 800,000 barrels a day, higher than expected. Um, and then we, we didn't lose oil from Russia. We, you know, we got more oil from Iraq and, so, and uh, so West Africa. So what's your new forecast? You know, it will depend a lot on you know, what OPEC will do this weekend, right? So it's hard to stick your neck out of the market. Our markets right now are finely balanced. They are not you know, massively oversupplied or undersupplied. It's like finely balanced. So... Uh, it's all at the margin. If OPEC does uh, a cut that's large enough, so I, I would say like a million barrels a day lower relative to current production, then the, ma then the market will go up. If they try to micromanage the market, you know, months to months, I think it will stay here or go a bit lower. And if the other OPEC members do not, you know, do, like, you know, do not want to cut and Saudi have to you know, to be the only one cutting, I think they will give up and, and potentially bring some production back online and then we'll go much higher. So it will depend a lot on that meeting. Yeah. Uh, so I'll have probably a better opinion on Monday. So you'll come back on Monday. Yeah. Um, Pierre, how's your fund doing? I know you, you've had some ups, you've had some yeah. downs. How difficult is it holding on, first of all, to your clients? Um, holding to the clients is okay for now um, because most of them have been with us for a very long time. So... Um, they've seen you know, a lot of good years, um, and so they don't, you know, um, leave at the first sign, you know, of, uh, like we recovered in the past of large drawdowns. It's just about being patient. I know that for me, the worst kind of markets are those kind of markets where there's no clear direction and it's very volatile. I mean, for the last year and a half, we have many times where oil prices would go down $10 in one or two days for no reason and then go back up. And so when you have like a strong view and then strong view means like a strong position, you end up being chopped by that volatility. And I've always done you know, badly in those type of markets, but they tend to be maybe 10% of the time we have those markets. And then we have the markets that are more obvious where it goes in one direction for some time. And, and then that's when we, we tend to do well. So why do you think it's these kind of markets that we're living with? Is it geopolitics at the margins that are so difficult to read, or is it actually countries that have behaved in, in ways that you weren't expecting? I think it's a lot of random events, right? As I said earlier, it's the fact that you have a lot of countries raising production at the same time, yeah. some cutting, and, and basically, it's, you know, at the end of the day, what makes the oil price is, is uh, supply minus demand. When inventories go down strongly, prices will go up and vice versa. So when you're in a situation where you have the um, supply increase, you know, meeting the demand increase, and there's a, a lot of, uh, um, and it's hard to forecast why the supply, what the supply increase will be next year and the demand increase, and the markets are volatile, and they don't go anywhere, and then that's when it becomes choppy. Yeah, what's your take on China? Again, this is the biggest unknown. Yeah. We saw foreign direct investment going into China, I think, negative for the first time since, it's, you know, since on record. Yeah. But it's unclear. Again, they're opening. We don't know how much support the government will actually give to, to some of these real estate developers. Well, it's, uh, I think they want to be careful because there's been so much speculation going into real estate, you know, like prices are just so high. So I think it's, uh, I'm not sure they'll come with a bazooka. I think it's going to be like marginal help. Um, but for the oil market, I don't think that, you know, the Chinese real estate market, you know, is, is such a driver for, for, for oil. I mean, it can be like a 
marginal plus, but it's, it's not what's going to drive the market going forward. So what's your outlook for, for the oil markets in 2024? There's a lot, yeah. a lot of unknowns. Yeah, it's a lot of unknowns, so it's hard to, to have a strong uh, opinion now. So I think uh, it will depend a lot on what OPEC you know, decides on Sunday, really. Did, I mean, if we have a Trump back in the White House, does that change also the, the course of the, the price of oil or certainly how much they'll produce? Maybe. I, I don't think it will change anything f for the U.S. supply because, you know, despite all the talk that, you know, Biden was hard on, you know, production growth, well, we have one of the top <laughs> production growth ever, like uh, in, in the U.S. So it's more driven by technological improvements and these kind of things. And... Um, but where it can have an impact, if, if Trump was to come back and he goes hard on Iran mm -hmm. and he goes hard on Venezuela, then we lose some oil and it could be marginally positive for the oil price. So it's going to be more from, you know, like foreign policy mm -hmm. than, than domestic uh, policy. But you're not, I mean, a lot of actually expecting a surplus in, you know, the oil because of the economy going down and uh, a lot of supply out there. Do you expect a kind of a, a significant downturn in some of the Western economies? Well, the thing is, um, when you look historically, if you have like a normal recession, like you don't lose much oil demand. You know, it's quite marginal. You lose like half a million barrels a day relative to an average year. And so it's nothing relative to what OPEC could cut or how much supply could disappoint. So I think on its own, it's not enough. Like a weak economy or even a recession is not enough to bring prices down. But if you have a weak economy coupled with a very strong supply growth in the U.S. and OPEC not cutting, then, yeah, of course, it's negative for oil prices. But on its own, um, when you look historically, we had 08 or 09 uh, brought like a, a strong you know, demand de decline, but that was not because of a recession. It was a full-blown financial crisis, right? It's, uh, the world stopped. And then, obviously, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. But when you look at average recessions, you don't lose so much uh, demand. Right. It's, it's quite marginal. But so, so if you look at the markets and the way there's positioning on the oil markets, but also in treasuries and everything yeah. else that you look at, mm. what are people misunderstanding? What are they getting wrong? I don't know if they're getting it wrong. I mean, so far, it's not more me getting it wrong. But the, I would say, like, the positioning for oil, the hedge funds are very short, or at least the speculative land is close to all-time low. Um, so I think they're looking at, I mean, it's hard to know what they're looking at because you have a lot of different funds, but, but I think the macro community in, in, in the U.S. is probably focused on uh, demand growth disappointing, like a weak economy to come and then like weak, uh, weak demand. But, but so far, demand kept on being revised up. So they've been wrong on that, you know, on that point. Will it come next year? Maybe, maybe not, uh, because I think there's still some uh, demand recovery from post-COVID to come, you know, like, uh, so I don't think demand will really be the issue, but the funds are actually quite short now, and they're short going into a big OPEC meeting, so, and I think the, you know, um, Prince Abdulaziz probably knows that they're short, and he might want to surprise them, but uh, but I think it's uh, the other ones, will, the other countries will have to cut as well. Yeah, I mean, going into this big OPEC plus meeting, what do you do? How, how do you actually work? Do you take a big position before? You just wait and see and then decide? I think, uh, I think it's better to wait and see. Um, I think it's more likely that it will be a bullish outcome, but there's also a low probability event that it might be a very bearish outcome. But I think it's more like a 10 or 15 yeah. percent probability in case the other OPEC members you know, uh, do not want to cut. And so there's a you know, 10 percent probability maybe that we go much lower as well. So in, in a way, you, I think you probably want to be positive going into that meeting, but be careful of the sizing in case something bad happens. And generally, uh, the market doesn't price news you know, right away, it tends to diffuse over time. So mm -hmm. it's better to wait for the result, analyze it, and then if it's, if it's obvious, then put the position after. So interesting. Pierre, thank you so much. Founder Pleasure. there of Endurant Capital Management, Pierre Endurant, joining us on the price of oil and supply and demand. Coming up, Binance and its chief executive officer plead guilty to criminal charges, agreeing to pay a $4.3 billion fine. More on that story next, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Binance and its chief executive, CZ, have pleaded guilty to money laundering and U.S. sanctions violations. Now, the sweeping settlement with U.S. authorities allows a cryptocurrency exchange to continue operating. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's senior crypto editor, Anna Herrera. Anna, good to speak to you. So what comes next for Binance? 
So this will be a super interesting story to follow, right? Richard Tang, the new CEO, takes over one of the biggest companies in crypto and probably one of the toughest jobs in crypto at the same time. He has to restore confidence in the exchange. They're still the biggest, but they've been losing market share. And at the same time, he has to continue to appease regulators in the U.S. who will continue to follow what the exchange has been doing. So he has to turn around this massive organization, which, as we've seen, has had massive compliance issues um, from the beginning. And, and how do you do that? Will he have enough power um, to do that when he comes in? So for sure, it's definitely one, one to follow. So what does it mean for crypto as a whole, Anna? I mean, again, it's the biggest exchange. So whatever happens to Binance tends to impact what happens to crypto. Um, we'll have to see if there are one of the biggest issues is will there be outflows from Binance? Because that's what we saw with FTX, right? People started panicking. They started taking money out. And then there was a sort of run in the bank. So if, if that doesn't happen and it doesn't really seem to be the case for now, then perhaps price will remain somewhat steady. We haven't seen that massive drop in Bitcoin, which you would expect for this uh, magnitude of news. But maybe people are getting used to big crypto executives, you know, uh, getting into legal trouble by now. Anna, thank you so much. Anna Herrera there of Bloomberg News. Now, France's top diplomat, Catherine Colonna, is visiting China after a European probe into Chinese electric vehicles raised fears of a potential tariff war. European car makers, including Stellantis and Renault, are exposing or exposed to rising imports of, cheapers, or of cheaper EVs from China. Now, France is expected to unveil support for local EV producers next month that will likely exclude China-made vehicles due to their carbon footprint. Now, the iconic car maker also Ferrari, famous for its roaring engine, is embarking on a new era as it switches to electric. I sat down with the company's chief executive officer, Benedetto Vigna, in the latest episode of Leaders with L'Aqua Goes Green. We have a specific, we have very detailed development process. So we have uh, what we call technically mulotype, prototype, before we end up with the, the final, uh, with the production of the final uh, product. So it's very much detailed. It takes uh, several quarters, and uh, we test the car in different conditions. But uh, it's very, very interesting. What are you most, most excited about? Is it the sound? The driving emotion, OK? The driving emotion, the performance, and also the design. They go all together. It's uh, like three wheels, mm -hmm. these three wheels, falling and uh, moving at the right speed all together. And then uh, this three is all encompassed by the sustainability. The Ferrari chief executive there, Benedetto Vigna. Now you can see that full interview on Leaders with L'Aqua Goes Green arriving, airing at 9.30 p.m. New York time uh, tonight in the U.S. and then 6.30 p.m. London time on Thursday. Now coming up, near non-stop talks are taking place to resolve the budget crisis in Germany. That's after a shock ruling by the country's top court. More on that story next. And this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse, and I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the German government is considering a complete overhaul of its year's budget to help to comply with a shock budget ruling by the country's top court. Now, the federal constitutional court ruled last week that it was unlawful to reallocate 60 billion euros worth of unused COVID-19 debt. Well, let's go live to Frankfurt and Bloomberg's German bureau chief, Christoph Rawald. So, Christoph, it's hard to overestimate, actually, the potential impact of this judgment. Yeah, it absolutely is, uh, because it affects uh, essentially um, investments, long-term investments across um, a wide range of different sectors that really rely, rely on the, on, on the, on the state-backed funding to invest in anything uh, that's re like related to new technology in Germany, electric vehicle infrastructure, the semiconductor industry, just to name two examples. And all these, all these investments are probably like under review to some degree because the federal budget uh, needs to be there to support that. So what exactly are the options on the table? Well, the main, the main option uh, seems to be that the government might move to suspend what is in Germany called the debt break, which limits borrowing uh, for like another fourth consecutive year, basically. That would give them the, the, the required leeway to actually disperse these funds and make these, in, make these investments uh, possible again. Having said that, that is something that like the German finance minister, Christian Lindner, has been very opposed against because his pro-business, -liber pro uh, liberal Democrats, um, one party of the 
three-way ruling coalition in Germany is fiercely against, has, or has been fiercely against that in the past. So that would really have to sort of overcome their current, uh, their current position. So, so what does that mean going forward, actually? Are we underestimating or overestimating the impact that this will have also, you know, going forward on how things operate in Germany and therefore the rest of the euro? Well, if, if, they can't, uh, if they can't deliver on that um, and, or come up with a solution that would again, or could again be challenged with, with, with like a, a legal challenge, as we've seen last week at the top German court in Karlsruhe, then that would basically force them to make uh, pretty painful cutbacks across the entire budget. And that would really threaten potentially the entire uh, coalition or the existence uh, of the current uh, three-way ruling coalition between the free um, Democrats, the, so the, so the Social Democrats, and the Green Party. And that would be, of course, something that would have major ramifications across Europe as well. All right, thank you so much, uh, Christoph Hauwald, their German bureau chief. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, from Germany. Also, shares in Siemens Energy fell nearly 12% after its head, the head of Gamesa, its troubled wind turbine unit, said he could not rule out for the potential equipment defects even after the company's internal review. Now, Gamesa has had to halt production of its newest turbines after technical flaws were found. A program of corrective measures is set to cost around 1.6 billion euros, and Gamesa has announced plans to cut 400 million euros in costs by 2026. Now, Siemens is down about 37 percent this year, following reports that the German government will intervene to help shore up its balance sheet. Also, voting is underway in the Dutch general election, where the far-right populist Geert Wilders has jumped to first place in the latest polls. Now, he looks set to benefit from the political vacuum left after the coalition of the former Prime Minister Mark Rutte collapsed over its refugee policy. Wilders' Freedom Party is projected to win 28 seats in Parliament, just one more than the two parties tied in second place. Now, this is what NVIDIA is doing. There's not a huge amount actually going on with the NVIDIA share price as we speak. It's down 1%, but extremely important pre-market uh, to have a look at it, given everything else we've had in this space. Also, OpenAI will bring back Sam Altman and overhaul its board with new directors and stunning reversal in a drama that's really transfixed Silicon Valley and the global AI industry. Now, let's have a look at what uh, stocks are doing. They were mixed earlier this morning. I think today they're a little bit on the upside. The dollar is gaining before some of the U.S. economic data. So, again, policymakers seem to be united around the strategy to proceed carefully uh, on future interest rate moves, but also base any further tightening on progress towards their inflation goal. Now, this has a lot of focus or will impact a lot of the decision making when we get some uh, jobless claims out of the U.S. today, also durable and capital goods orders, but also consumer sentiment later today. That may, of course, as always, provide some of the clues on the direction of monetary policy after we had minutes of the Federal Reserve's last rates meeting revealed that officials remain in a cautious mode. Now, a reminder, we'll also have a special coverage of the U.K. autumn statement later today with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, speaking at 12.30 p.m. London time. You can catch that on TV on the terminal and online. This is Bloomberg.